Great. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining today. Um, I'm going to get started. My name is Sarah. I'm a manager on the data science team at Salesforce, specifically in the Einstein Initiative. Um, and I'll be talking today maybe a little bit differently from some of the other talks, um, a bit more on the applied side, on the impact um, on business with machine learning, and specifically at Salesforce, um, how we do it with Scala. Um, so a show of hands is usually helpful. How many folks here um, have worked on artificial intelligence projects? Okay, so a fair number, um, but there are also um, quite a few that have not. So um, yes, rate the, uh, the talk. So I'll definitely start off with an overview of what happens in industry today with artificial intelligence, um, just to give a general sense of where things are at. Um, actually, prior to Salesforce, I worked with another software company, Pivotal, uh, that provides, in addition to a bunch of other types of software, um, big data, database, and um, things that sit on top of Hadoop. And what I did was I worked with many companies um, building kind of one-off solutions. And so I'll be able to talk about what um, Salesforce does that's very, very different. So specifically switching over to uh, the multi-tenant artificial intelligence environment, what that is. And, Specifically how at Salesforce, we solve that problem with Optimus Prime, um, so I'll talk about what that is. And then take a use case driven overview, so walk through kind of how Optimus Prime works by taking an example of apps that we build and walking through the code a bit. So I think although maybe in general AI might not be familiar to everyone uh, from the perspective of building an app, AI is permeating all parts of our life. So, um, when we think about using our phone, um, maybe it's you know for some speech to text, uh, certainly for things like on a website browsing for items, um, we're actually experiencing AI at all times. So we have our recommendations that might be about what to buy, what to watch, um, and, and so without even knowing it, we're often contributing back to AI refining process and having those companies do a better job at serving you as a customer. Um, of course, there are cars now that can drive themselves, um, and in medicine, we also have examples of trying to improve the way that we treat patients, um, developing new drugs, new protocols, and of course, for a long, long time, we've had these concepts in kind of the stock trading space. Now, generally speaking, um, in AI, when you're focused on building an app, what you do is you pick a single user journey, and so we'll take the example right now, um, for starters, of something that should be familiar to most of you, which is a recommendation. So are you likely to buy an item, and therefore should I recommend it to you? Usually what you do is you pick one user kind of uh, perspective, and you decide, okay, well, we're gonna focus on the, sell or the buyer, not the seller, for example. And we're gonna start off with the assumption that we know that there's a fixed data schema, so we're gonna have a certain amount of information coming in, maybe purchases, tra and prior transactions, how we paid, uh, what items were bought. And based on that, um, companies will build models that might predict whether or not you're willing to buy something. And what they're then able to measure is how well we are predicting by how many, sort of the increase in lift, how many more things we're selling to you. Um, so what that means is we have predefined metrics, we have an understanding, very deep understanding of what we're trying to build. And so in general, when companies go through these processes, what they do is um, here we're seeing the standard methodology used um, of trying to decide how to build an app that will serve your customer. So we go through this briefly. Uh, the way this works is you start off usually with a business understanding, and this is a process, again, that in my previous job I used to do one-on-one -on -one with one customer at a time for one given application. So you start off, you're trying to understand the business problem. So again, in our previous example, that was whether or not you'd be able to predict if someone is willing to buy something and therefore serve that example up as, you know, are you willing to click on this? So you start off with that, and then you go over to your data set, which might be all of your customer transactions. And you begin to try and understand things about that data. So I have some assumptions about you know, customer uniqueness, the items that are available, whether or not a transaction happened, if there was a return, et cetera. And you would iterate back and forth and look for anomalies in the data, how to clean it up, how to actually understand whether or not a sale happened, and go back, verify what you're seeing in the data to your business understanding. And so you'll frequently cycle around um, this business understanding to data understanding, uh, those two blocks of, of what occurs. So let's say you kind of get a good solid grasp of what your data is saying and how that translates into your business problem. The next thing you need to do is go through data preparation. So what data preparation is you take, for example, a long history of transactions, things that might have occurred, and you're trying to convert those into what we call features. Uh, features are things that you feed into a model that allow you to predict that outcome. 
um, by kind of taking it through a set of processes, which we'll talk about a bit. So once you feel you have a good set of features, maybe you understand how to transform them, um, some different processes that you go through, you want to then build that model. And you might so select one of a few algorithms, go through, understand how well you're performing, um, and then iterate through the cycle of possibly trying new model forms, adding more features, jumping back and forth, and then evaluating how well you do. So you want to hold out some data and understand on unseen data how well does this model generalize. Sometimes what will happen is you might see how to segment your model separately, so understand different consumer bases and how you would target them, and maybe go all the way back up to that business understanding. Um, hopefully at some point you go through the cycle, settle, and go to deployment, which means you can actually start figuring out how to serve that up to your customers and automate the process of recommendations. That's great. Um, doing one of those is obviously a massive feat. Uh, requires a data scientist, often data engineers, uh, front-end folks to build those applications. Now let's say you want to do something other than recommending an item to buy, but maybe you want to detect fraud. So to fraud detection, you would have to go through the same process, business understanding of your problem. Maybe there's the same data set that you get to work off, so that's great, but you'll still have to cycle through this process many times. Add a third app for a new topic. Uh, maybe it's whether or not to process a return. You'll just continue going through the cycle. The problem is, uh, one issue is that a majority of business, for a majority of businesses is actually quite out of reach, uh, and that's for a variety of reasons. So one of them is actually simply that um, your, your sort of ability to grab data out um, might be a challenge. So we have customers that have data living in multiple silos, they need to sort of bring them together, put them in a data warehouse. Um, that alone is a large, usually data engineering focused feat. How to bring it together and be able to construct something meaningful out of it then is the data scientist's feat. Um, so of course you have to kind of hire both of these groups and imagine every single one of those applications needing a new set of people to, to execute on that task. That actually doesn't even talk about kind of the DevOps piece, so you have to have infrastructure available and make sure that you can maintain and keep it up at all times. Uh, see when things go sideways and make sure that you react to it um, appropriately. So this is clearly a challenging feat to accomplish for any individual customer. Now at Salesforce, um, we have a CRM that allows customer basically to capture data about their touch points with their own customers. Um, so what we do is we serve companies like Uber that use it, um, the marketing cloud to be able to reach out to both their drivers and uh, riders. Uh, we have Comcast that uses it to manage their cases, for example. So in a customer service setting, um, if you're interacting, it can go through uh, Service Cloud. We have Square that does their sales pipelines. And again, it's ca capturing all of those customer um, touch points and then taking it all the way through to um, cash there. We have UCSF, which is a hospital in San Francisco that manages their patients through it. Um, we actually have hundreds of thousands of customers that work on a variety of the different subsets of um, offerings that we have. And so what we do is we're able to collect data on all of those um, companies and, and allow them to access it um, in order to meaningfully interact with their customers. So what that means is if we want to build AI into our applications, um, as I mentioned before, each one of these companies might have different applications that they want, um, around fraud detection, sales, marketing, et cetera. Uh, what that also means is that each one of our customers wants to have their own unique models. Um, they want to take advantage of the data sets that they have that are unique to them uh, to be able to build the best model possible to serve their customers. What does this mean? Um, Considering that we have a lot of different clouds, so a lot of different ways that our customers might be capturing data, and certainly a lot of different use cases, how on earth could we possibly scale to the number of data scientists we would need alone in order to accomplish that task, in order to serve our customers so they can best serve their customers? So, of course, we can't hire all the world's data scientists, um, so what we actually have is the Salesforce Einstein which is a way for us to get through this process by building software and platforms that enable us and folks within our um, company that are data scientists to make that process as painless as possible um, to build models for each of our individual customers to serve their customers. Okay, so now that I've kind of given this concept of um, high-level overview of AI and this concept of what we're gonna consider multi-tenant AI, which is when you have multiple customers each wanting their own models as well, Let's talk about um, how to build a model. So for some of you in the room that have done this before, um, won't be, it'll, it won't be anything new. Um, but for everyone else, I kind of just want to construct it so that when we later go through the code, everything makes a lot of sense. 
So first thing, um, we refer to something as a response variable, which is what we want to predict. And I'm gonna take a toy example here. Later we'll go through another example that is specific to what we try to build at Salesforce. Um, but let's take that example of wanting to predict whether or not a customer is likely to purchase an item. So response variables, um, which is what we're trying to predict, in this case is a binary, a yes or a no. Will you purchase or not? Um, there are also other types of predictions that you might want, like time to event or amount of something. Uh, which might be a regression and continuous variable, we'll be talking about the binary example both now and in the later uh, use case that I'll go through. So features are these attributes or factors that we derive from the data that are gonna allow us to predict whether or not someone is likely to buy. So if we think about purchasing, um, I might be able to predict whether or not someone's gonna purchase based on their purchasing history, so the types of items that they've bought, the prices of those items, maybe information about their zip code, so where they live might be indicative of the types of items that they wanna buy. So what we do is we derive features or these attributes that can then be plugged into a model uh, to predict that response. So specifically that model itself is how those predictors re relate to that response. Um, and of course there are any number of algorithms available. Um, so there is logistic regression, random forest naive Bayes, that's just a few. Um, we'll talk about support vector machines on the next slide. Um, of course there are any number um, of others that are out there. Specifically the ones here are for binary predictions again. Lastly, we have scores. So what happens in a model is you'll take a set of data which we'll consider the training data, and what you wanna do is derive a model so that any new data that comes in will now allow us to predict what we think the likelihood is for someone to purchase a particular item, again, given a model. So a new customer would come in, and I would want to use that model to decide whether or not we're likely to buy. So how do we build models for customers? Um, so here I'm showing some Python code. Python is a language of choice for a lot of data scientists out there. Um, there's also R, and of course what we'll be going through later, um, Scala spe specifically with Spark. Um, so Skykit-Learn is one of those libraries out there that actually has a large number of those algorithms implemented that I was mentioning on the previous slide. Uh, so here we'll take an example of trying to build a model um, using support vector machines. So the first question, um, I listed a few of those others. Why should we try only this model? What other model forms might we want to try? Um, not only that, I mentioned some features that we're deriving. Um, so here we're loading up some features. There might be a lot of other features. So how do we know that any model, for example, if I'm building this for one customer or a tenant, how do I know that generalizes to the next one? Um, of course, there's some ugly code here um, that actually is going to have a bunch of uh, hyperparameters that you can tune. Um, actually, in the case of an SVM, what you can do is use different kernels. So how do you transform that set of features into a um, higher dimensional space so that you can come up with a way to actually separate the data nicely into will purchase or will not purchase. Lastly, um, like I mentioned, each one of these customers, so if I build this model, this framework for one customer, what do I actually do in order to make sure that I can then easily sign up another customer and have a specific model with the, the specific set of hyperparameters, so the form, the features that are correct for that one? So while this works for one customer, how are we gonna make it work for any customer that wants to sign up? So Einstein tries to solve that problem as well, and I'll go through how we do that. But specifically what we do is we have a framework that we build that allows us for any customer that comes in for a given use case, let's say conversion like we discussed, um, you would wanna build a model, kind of have a bake off for each one of them. So the top customer will build many different models with lots of different hyperparameters and different uh, model forms. And what we do is that one will have a bake off winner. And going forward, what we can do is any new data that comes in for that customer will actually be cycled through and scored with that customer's specific model. Same thing would be true for each of the separate ones. And what's nice is the code actually doesn't need to be changed in any way. Um, our, our framework that we have allows that to adapt to any new data set that comes in. So how do we do that? Um, in our platform, we think a lot about automation. So again, scaling to hundreds of thousands of customers is difficult, and we can't have data scientists for every single one of them. Um, so what we actually need to do is teach computers how to do this. Um, what we want is a framework that actually allows that to happen easily. So really we need our machines to start doing or taking over for data scientists once we get it to a good state. So the platform that we've built, um, this AWS-based platform, um, not gonna go through too much of it. Um, it's largely based on Scala and Spark um, in particular and there's some scheduling that happens, there's a lot around how we manage data, how we keep it extremely secure, make sure that 
the different tenants stay separate, that there's access control to it. Um, and of course, it really focuses in that sense on this multi-tenant, so meaning trying to build multiple models for different customers. Um, so there's a lot, there are a lot of services underlying this platform, but what I'll be focusing on is specifically the modeling and scoring bit. So that is um, the Scala-based library that I'll be going through uh, from here on out. So let's go back to the Salesforce use case. Um, I'm gonna argue that this is actually something that anybody who wants to build a data science as a service software, so software where you wanna be able to generalize to any customer that comes in, will have to think through these same types of challenges. So in our case, uh, we have structured data with a very rich schema, and what we wanna do is take advantage of the knowledge that we have about the schemas, the metadata that's there, in order to build new models for any given customer. So we sort of have two options anytime a new customer comes in. So again, one of the people that we're trying to build a model for. Um, we can either see what the overlap is between first customer and second customer, and since these are very, very customizable um, types of software tools that we have available, um, that means that over time we have kind of the choice to narrow down to a very small subset of features or attributes that are not custom to each one of our end customers, or we can try and figure out how to scale to a number of data scientists, which is infeasible, or again, come up with this framework. So arguably something everyone has to think about. So the next thing we have are multiple teams. Um, so all of the teams within Salesforce that have data scientists do want to build models and do want to serve those out. Um, so what we want to solve for them is this ability to generalize um, the DevOps piece. And then of course the fact that they're working on that same ultimate base of data, we would like them to be able to share their learnings, their models, their features that they engineer. And so we really want to focus on that as well. Um, lastly, this is, again, is not Salesforce specific, but in general, uh, developers in this space don't necessarily have a deep Spark ML expertise, and even if they do, there are a lot of things that make it a little bit challenging to use, and we'll talk about how we solve those problems in particular. Uh, so we'll be talking about Optimus Prime next, um, where really our focus was to create this um, simple declarative type safe syntax to allow us to build these models, and again, that reusability bit. So we don't want every single team that goes out there to start implementing from scratch everything that they want to build, and instead for us to take advantage of a shared repository as we go through it. Optimus Prime, which is what I'll be spending the rest of uh, this talk on, is this multi-tenant machine learning framework. And what it's aimed at is to allow us to build, as data scientists, production-ready machine learning pipelines um, that are automatically going to produce good models for any number of those tenants that decide to sign up, so to say, OK, take my data through this process and predict a model um, at scale, so without requiring 100,000 data scientists to serve 100,000 customers. So Optimus Prime, let's talk about what that is. Um, so firstly, it's... Um, Again, meant for these non-expert users, um, so it's declarative, type-safe syntax, um, enables people that are not necessarily expert in uh, Spark ML to be able to take advantage of it, and it's collaborative, so I'll talk about how they're able to share the work that they do. What was really important for us is there's a very rich community of developers out there um, that are actually continuously refining what Spark ML does, so adding different algorithms, I mentioned a few. Those are constantly being developed. We can only keep up if we make we take advantage of what's out there, and so we want to make sure that we're actually taking care of kind of using those algorithms and also the underlying execution engine. So a lot of that optimization can then be leveraged. Um, the reason why it's called Optimus Prime is Spark itself is just, um, in, in general actually machine learning is just a series of transformations that take place, so um, take one of the transformers, I guess the best one. So switching briefly to a use case, which we'll use to walk through our code now, um, what I'll be talking about specifically is a service cloud use case. So service cloud is one of Salesforce's offerings that allows customers to sign up, um, so Comcast was one example that we gave, to build um, ways to interact with their end customers um, in the service use case for sort of possibly customer complaints or issues that they have that come up. Um, so you have multiple individuals that are working on these to resolve um, cases with customers. And you can imagine there can be large volumes of these cases coming in. And there are any number of challenges where what we want to do is actually be able to have an impact on their business process by making those things easier for the agents that are responsible for solving the problems. So one of the things when a, when a case comes in, um, and we'll be talking specifically about ones that come in from emails, for example. So I'm sure you've emailed like support at, for example. Um, that might be routed for some of, the for some of those companies through Salesforce. Um, but of course that comes in kind of a barren case. 
Um, there might also be a web form that you fill out where you kind of, with your email address and some content about kind of an issue that you had. Um, sometimes I ask for refunds on my Wi-Fi, for example, so it might be something related to that. So some of the things that um, are use cases that Salesforce wants to work on to automate for our customers, for example, might be to classify uh, the inbound case as one of a series of possible reasons why there's contact that allow them to triage them easily. Um, again, a smart response, so if an email or request comes in, might be able to serve up an answer immediately without needing to, in some cases, uh, go through the tedious task of just copy-pasting something that a service agent might have to do. Um, predict time to resolution, so if we understand how complex a task is, you can imagine queuing it up properly so an agent isn't necessarily overloaded. Um, but any of these use cases um, might be useful. And again, we wouldn't have to build one that's unique for every single tenant, of course, underlying their differences that they have. So what I'm gonna walk through is one actually fundamental thing that's pretty common across any use case uh, for something like inbound requests. So let's talk about how we would build an AI-based spam filter. So anybody could technically email support at, so how do you figure out what's real and what's noise? So we'll walk through this really quickly. Um, in this case, again, we're talking about a binary response variable, whether or not this particular request is spam on the service cloud case that's coming in. Um, we'll be talking about the factors that we're gonna use. So that could be the, the body, the content, so what's actually in that request, um, the source, the email address, for example, and a company that might be associated with the person who sent the request in. Um, the model, again, will use one of these, um, and the scores is how likely this particular case is to be spam, so you might triage it if it's probably spam. So let's talk about how we actually do this. Um, so the first most important thing that, um, again, I talked about was this concept of type safety. So it's really important for us to be able to, especially um, because we're using Spark, to be able to introduce that concept. So we'll be talking about this toy example um, where, we're t where we have our, our case. So it's a bit confusing, but um, a case object, which is actually talking about um, inbound, kind of think about it as um, an example, so a problem that's come in. So in it, we're gonna have a label that's been applied to past cases of whether or not it's spam. That's what we wanna predict for any new case that comes in. So we're gonna have information that's attached to that case, so it's subject, um, which is the subject line if it's an email or maybe the kind of top bar um, in a form. The description, which is that body um, where someone, a customer has typed out some lengthy bit of information. Um, the name, so if there's a form that allows them to enter a name. The company that they're associated with, and again, their email address. So this is all the information that we have available. So you can imagine the first thing that we have to do, of course, is to derive something meaningful out of this raw text in order to be able to predict something going forward. So what are the, some of the challenges if we're wanting to do that? Um, so if a data scientist today decided to build this on top of Spark, um, so Spark allows you to work with very large scale data, which is generally what you would have um, in these instances, um, how would you go about, for example, defining features? So a feature that might be actually interesting for you to do is to have, rather than the actual text, how long the content of the um, subject and email is. So it turns out that if I'm probably writing something like you know, a request, I probably won't have a massive email. That might be a good indicator of spam. So one of the things I might wanna derive out of my subject and my content is the actual length of the two and be able to have that as a feature now that I use. So it's a derived feature from my raw data. Now what does this look like in Spark? First thing I have to do is create my function, then register that UDF, and now I wanna apply it. So in Spark, when you wanna do that, what you're gonna have to do is have a data frame that you're using that contains your training data. So this will be our train data frame. That's how we're gonna derive the model. And we have to reference our fields that we're interested in, so our columns. So the first issue here that we run into is that we need to make sure that for train DF, those are the names of the columns, subject, content. And we actually have no information about what the type is of subject and content. So I could actually make a mistake, I could put something in that is nonsensical, and I would then get a runtime error. So I could have this job running, and at some st stage later, I could go through a long process and actually only see it much, much later. Next thing, I actually just create a new column, content length, it's some name that I type in, um, and later on, if I wanna use it, I have to make sure I'm referencing that exact same field name, content length. So again, it has to, we have to be sure that that's in the data frame itself. Now what happens is for any subsequent data that comes in, which we wanna test on, for example, to see how well we're doing on a holdout set, 
um, we better make sure that subject and content was copy pasted appropriately, of course, that it exists there, and that we do everything the same so that we can actually not run into these errors at runtime because we wouldn't know at the beginning whether or not something would happen when we're compiling. So how do we solve that problem with Optimus Prime? Well, first thing is that what we have is the ability to actually reference, to have pointers to things like features. So here we've introduced that concept, which is just a pointer type safe to the data frame. So now we can actually know at compile time whether or not things are correct. Uh, the next thing is we have these objects, so a case object. Um, so again, rather than an arbitrary data frame, we know what we're working with. And again, it's all type safe. Uh, we defined it earlier on. So now what we can do is just take that and apply it back uh, to any case object. So it doesn't depend on that underlying data. We can just pass in new data sets, read them in, apply those same functions again and again. So that's one kind of huge benefit that comes out of this is the beginning, the, the introduction of type safety and also the fact that I can reference content length at any point in my code and we kind of know everything that's there. Um, of course, in the other instance with data frames, I wouldn't know up front if I just later on in my code decided to name another column the same thing. It's just a string. I wouldn't actually know if I've created content length twice. So let's think of some more derived features that we might want to create. So again, let's go back to Spark. Um, one thing that you might generally want to do, so if we look at one customer, um, let's say you know it's a large bank, the type of email that they would get inbound might be very different from maybe, um, I don't know, one that is uh, like a, I don't know, some retailer. So the types of emails, um, the length of the data, for example, you want to scale those generally. So rather than having you know, any large number of range, you'd want to figure out how to transform it and normalize it. So the way that would work again in Spark is that you'd use your standard scaler, and again, you have to reference by text the columns that you're interested in using and set an output column there as well. Uh, then you'll have to fit it and then transform it. This is a process that you would have to go through. With OP, again, we get to reference that exact typed content length, so the pointer, so we know exactly what we're dealing with. Uh, we know whether or not there's a problem at any point. Um, we have these estimators that are available to us. We just get the output. Um, another benefit because of this is that we're able to actually come up with like very clean syntax to be able to, look, to work with it. It's much more intuitive, so anybody working with it can actually create these much shorter uh, ways of, of, for example, here normalizing. Uh, there are any other, um, there are any number of other types of things that you might want to do. For example, um, if we want to work with um, the actual content of the emails, so the words that are there. Uh, we might be interested in actually extracting some of the words or tokens that are used and seeing which ones are overrepresented in spam. So there might be some words that tend to occur in spam, e spam emails or some distribution of that data that we'd be interested in working with. And so what we can do, again, for a description subject, any string that we would like, we can plug it in and actually extract, in this case, the thousand tokens. So we sort of compress it to a space that makes sense and be able to derive a new set of features from it. Um, so you can see then we end up with our OP vector. Um, some other things we might want to do is manipulate things like email, cast them to lowercase, and again, because we have the ability to build in ways that we work with certain types, we can say, okay, well, with email, that's the type that we're working with, and I'll show you how that then means that we can apply certain types of transformations to it as well, um, since it's a known type. So the last thing uh, that we wanted to solve with SparkML, uh, which I'll go through, um, so who in the room has actually worked with uh, SparkML? Okay. so. This is um, a slide that um, uh, Shuba, my colleague, actually put together. A lot of these slides are taken from her talk, um, which is a fantastic slide. And I remember first coming to Salesforce and seeing this and just thinking like, oh yeah, that's like yet another thing in addition to everything that we've already seen. Um, that's like very impactful. So here what we're doing is we're using a logistic regression and we are going to set some of the hyperparameters and we're then going to create our model, which we will then fit to a data frame um, and then we can after that, apply it to any data set that we would like. So for those folks in the room that have worked with Spark ML, can you tell me what the inputs are to this particular logistic regression? Yes, it's like quite painful. Um, it's actually features and label. Who knew that those have to exist inside of data frame? Because you don't specify them anywhere. The outputs. Probability, raw prediction, prediction, wonderful. Imagine the mistakes that you can made, make that then would not show up until runtime. Ouch. So again, uh, one of the things that Optimus Prime offers is transparency. You will know that there will be a failure, and you can actually say, oh, I would like to predict spam, 
and case feature vector. It will be my input, my set of features. Um, again, you know what the outputs are and their types. It's wonderful, it's much cleaner, more transparent. Um, allows you to work with uh, these, these data sets and building these pipelines in a much faster way. So again, this type safety and the ability to have these you know, intuitive shortcuts and being able to understand what types we're working with at any time um, actually allows our developers to be much more productive. It also means that we can have nice things like auto-completion when we're typing out and understanding what we're working with. Um, and again, compile time checks rather than finding out when you're running these extremely large models what's happening, um, having that fail later. Um, so I guess since there are some folks in the room um, that are not familiar with Spark ML, I'll, I'll just quickly talk about that and then kind of feed into uh, where Optimus Prime sits. So Spark ML is just essentially this set of transformers and estimators. So you can think of a transformer as what we were talking about with feature engineering. So it takes a number of columns and produces a new column. So it, you can add one to the data frame. So think about it, it takes subject and email and then figures out their length and then creates a new column that's just the length of those columns. Um, our estimators are actually these algorithms like logistic regression that allow us to take action um, and therefore estimator, uh, tra estimators become transformers. They can take action and produce a new column, for example, that prediction um, for each one of the examples that comes in. So Spark ML pipelines just are a series of these transformers and estimators chained together. And so what OP does is it sits on top of that and allows you to build those pipelines, again, with this type safe syntax, um, and then kind of allows Spark ML underneath it to um, kind of optimize that flow for you and create the DAG. Um, I'll skip this in the interest of time uh, to make sure that we can also go through this concept of collaboration and future engineering on top of um, OP and, and kind of what that helps with. So if we talk about um, this concept of wanting to build models, let's say off of case features, what we can do again is define a whole bunch of them that can then be used by anybody else who's interested in building these types of models. So we'll just go through again, and you can see they're all typed. Um, we're working with spam, which is the thing we're trying to predict. Um, we can de define it as a response, which means we'll have certain nice characteristics associated with it. Um, we have other ones that we're doing, so we have subject and description, which we'll derive. We have these feature vectors, which are basically the words that we're going to use then. Um, there are occurrences in order to predict whether or not something is spam. Um, so for company, you might have things that could be, uh, that, that you're trying to grab that could need to be cast, for example, to lowercase, um, and then you'd want to know kind of um, how many of them are totals, uh, what is the overall set of possible um, uh, companies that, that are in my overall data set. Uh, we have our email again. We can have that type email, which allows us to take certain types of operations, and then the ones that we discussed, um, content and length. So in addition to being able to share those types of basic features, there might be things that you want to engineer that are common um, so that each of the data scientists within the organization could you know, create a new transformer and contribute it back, but also then you know, derive certain features that you might be wanting to commonly use across um, different applications. So one thing that we have uh, for a common transformation, again, we can use an email domain extractor. It's frequently something that you might want to do, which is to know not necessarily the person who sent the email, but what the domain was, so what maybe company that represents. Um, and so we have these types of um, commonly used transformations available. Um, and again, type safety is introduced there, so we know we're operating on emails. Um, again, we have this nice um, syntax that, we're, that is much more intuitive that is available. So another thing, uh, we frequently, and this might be a problem that, again, is not terribly familiar to the folks that have not worked um, on building their own models, but a very, very common problem is missing data. Um, so it might be, for example, if an email comes in as opposed to a web form, um, the company may not be there. And so what we do is often operate on top of um, possibly missing values and need to kind of infer something. And so what we can do is take advantage here of being able to determine whether or not uh, there is an empty field. So if company is empty, we'd want to extract that. And then next we want to vector, so we want to create a binary whether or not it's present, which is an indicator variable of if it is empty. So there might be an increased likelihood for something to be spam if no company is provided. And you'd want to include that in the model. Uh, some other types of, um, we'll consider them interaction features, but features where you want to do maybe some more complex, um, sometimes they're just multiplications. And in this case, the interaction terms um, are some of the things that we've implemented. So here it's n-gram similarity. So how similar is the email domain to the provided company? So it might be that if those things don't match up well, that it's likely to be spam. 
Um, how similar is the name to the email prefix? Is it, again, some jargon, or is it like, my, in my case, s Ernie or sarah.erny? Uh, that might be something that you would want to do. And so deriving those features, a similarity metric, which, again, you can use as a feature in your model, that can then be predictive of whether or not it's spam. Um, another one is categorical pivot. You can imagine the number of um, email domains or the number of possible names coming in is very large. But maybe Bob tends to be an email that's associated with spam. Maybe certain types of domains are associated with spam. Um, I won't mention specific ones, but uh, generally speaking, there's a very long tail of available ones, and so you might want to use maybe the top five. So implementing this type of code could be challenging. Instead, we've created these types of transformers um, that, again, are available for use. So now what? Um, so I told you that we want to predict the field. Again, we're able to just reference these. We don't have to worry about how that's just a column name or what type it is. Um, we have all of our set of features that we've defined. Last thing we want to do is combine those all. So again, we have this feature vector that we create um, of a certain type that we can work for, and we can just continue adding them, just continue combining them. So again, if you wanted to share this type of um, framework, you'd be able to just decide you want to add another feature that you've derived and add it to your overall set that you're working with. Last thing is this monster of a slide um, that I'll go over. But really what you want to do is this last bit, which is build your model. Um, so again, I'll, I'll walk through it. And unfortunately, I don't have a pointer, so we'll just go line by line. Uh, but what we might have are kind of the different types of models that we will want to try out, and again, with different hyperparameters on the data sets. And we will want to make sure that we can figure out amongst all of the available ones that we have, how would you want to work with, for every individual customer, a pipeline that allows that to happen generally without needing to modify things? So not sort of if statements. Um, so what we do is we, again, have that ability to be very transparent about what the output is, so prediction, raw, and probability. Um, so what we're going to do is use that binary classification model selector. So that with the model selector, again, it's been implemented um, to allow you to choose the right one out of the set that will be attempted here so that it can be used specific for each customer that signs up for using this type of, of framework. So what we're going to do is using a cross-validation framework, um, which basically allows you to say, uh, you know, leave a set out. How well do I perform? Just keep holding the data out so we have a good kind of way of understanding if it generalizes to new data that comes in. Um, so that cross-validation framework, the first thing we'll want to do, um, data balancer, we don't know how much spam might be in one customer versus another, so we want to adjust that by saying, okay, we'd like the sample fraction to look a certain way. Um, the number of folds cross-validation, so it might be 10 different sets that we're running. And the validation metric here, it's AUPR, AUROC might be another one to use, so area under the receiver operator curve, for example. Um, so the next thing you do is list out your hyperparameters that you're going to be searching. So for logistic regression, you have your regularization parameter, the iterations um, that you're kind of capping out on, and your elastic net parameter. And then random forest have another set. Um, so you then say that you'd like to try the logistic and the random forest, and you again set your input and output transparently, or your input and features transparently, and get your output from that. Um, so you'd be able to run forward with that. So I gave you the example of classification. Um, Optimus Prime actually also includes the ability to do regressions and other types of modeling um, that might be of interest. So um, went through that quickly. It's not necessarily something to absorb, but kind of the, the context of how this breaks up the ability to say, run this, run this, run this, run this, figure out what the best one is, and then make sure that you apply that to this uh, tenant going forward. So I want to leave. Five minutes for questions. So some key takeaways when we think about what we walked through here. So machine learning is hard in the sense of being able to get it into a production is, is no small feat, and the ability to apply it to many different tenants is even more difficult. Um, so one of the things that we're trying to solve for is this ability to collaborate um, on the feature engineering, on the modeling, so that companies can iterate quickly. Um, so if they want to add yet another transformer, they'd be able to contribute to the repository. They can bootstrap this new model development. Um, that improved developer productivity, so the fact that we introduced type safety, you know, at compile time, if there's going to be a problem, um, kind of the code completions, the ability to then take um, advantage of, of just speeding things up in that process. Um, and again, the fact that this is all really due to type safety, that we're able to do that and introducing that on top of M uh, Spark ML. So, of course, there's much, much more. Um, I would encourage you to check out talks by Matthew Tobin 
and uh, Shuba Nabar, Leah McGuire. These are all excellent resources. They're the ones that are really like the, the work behind all of Optimus Prime, whereas I just get to kind of play on top of it and take advantage of what's there um, in order to work with the teams to build models. So huge, t huge thanks to those folks um, and the entire Einstein team. And if you're curious, check out um, you know, all of our available kind of different links, but also if you're interested in the team itself, um, feel free to reach out. So thank you, I'm willing to take questions. Um, it seems like you guys are involved in building the models, deploying the models to production, and probably versioning the models. Are you also tracking the continued success of a model? Yeah. So when it's identified for retraining, or is that just a roadmap thing? Because that, that's yeah. something we haven't found anything that has yet. No, absolutely. So unfortunately, you know, there was limited time. Um, we wanted to make sure, sorry, it's like the worst to cycle through it, that we really focus on part of the platform that allowed me to kind of just hone in on one subset of the overall bit. Um, so we absolutely have things like you discussed, like model versioning. Um, yes, the deployment, we definitely want to make sure that, um, you know, while the team, Einstein, helps build the models, it's really in order for others to use this platform going forward. Um, but we absolutely have um, a lot underlying it for being able to, at the top there, monitoring tools, so look at metrics. Um, again, if you have 100,000 customers using this, you can't throw alerts all the time. They have to be meaningful alerts. They have to be actionable alerts. So there are things built in to make sure to say, like, hey, you know, this model has degraded in performance. What's that? <laughs> um, well, these are sort of individual tenants. And I apologize, I did the thing I wasn't supposed to, which is to repeat the question. Um, it was whether or not we have other things besides just the modeling so that we work with deployment. Um, versioning of the models, and then I was mentioning the uh, monitoring. So when somebody turns it on, you know, you need to alert every, every company out there that has AI um, in production, you need to be able to alert, you know, whether it's the, the data scientist or the data engineer if there's a problem, um, but also then, again, if you want to deploy it to more and more customers, when you have everybody just turning it on saying, I would like it and I would like it, needing to make sure that we only go after the things that are truly problematic um, if there's something unique to that customer. Okay, uh, I, I have two questions. Um, the first, is uh, Optimus Prime open source? Uh, do you have to repeat that? Mm. No, okay. Um, we're working on making it open source. Um, it isn't for now, but it is in our roadmap. Okay. We're hoping to make it open source soon. Uh, and the second question is, uh, does it support imputation when dealing with missing data? Um, yeah, so I gave the one example of imputing something pretty basic, which is presence and absence. Um, what I didn't get to go through are these concepts of being able to also take an average, for example. Again, that's something that you're able to do um, in Spark as well, and we introduced that concept with really clean syntax. And again, I think um, Shuba Nabar has an example in her slides about how to do it. Um, Matthew Tobin might have an example in his as well. Leah McGuire might also. Um, but yes, these things are all implemented. Um, because it is a huge challenge. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, hello, and thanks for a good presentation. Uh, I got a question regarding type safety. So I can understand that Spark ML doesn't support data sets, but um, uh, from data frames to data sets, there is an easy conversion. So why not to just stick with that and uh, maybe you experience some problems or there are some, uh, um, yeah, so yeah. maybe you share experience. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so some of that was recently. It's a more recent thing, um, for starters. So OP actually is, we're on the next version of it. Um, it's, so it's also the ability, like you can see, to work with them and then have operations that we perform on top of them. So we have a rich library of ways to work with it. And then we have types that are very specific, again, like email, um, that, that just will, for now, don't exist. Um, I, again, the space is evolving, and we're going to make sure that we continue working with the Spark ML community, what it pushes out, to make sure that it, we don't do things that are redundant, but hopefully that answers your question. Hi, thanks for the presentation. Um, you have a multi-tenant environment. Is it, does it also cater for your infrastructure? Like, is, is, it, is your infrastructure or your Hadoop cluster or your Spark jobs, are they separated for every client that you have to separate data and those kind of things? 
Um, yeah, so I didn't get to go into kind of how the data is separated um, or anything that we do around scheduling um, to make sure that cost is managed of our infrastructure. Um, I'm, I'm sure we'll have talks about that separately at some point, um, about how we have developed these services that allow us to you know, appropriately spin things up um, when, it, when it makes sense. Um, but yeah, data currently is uh, residing in a data lake that also has um, ways to separate and manage control so that you know, I can't look at um, tenants that I can't look at data for in general and that I build models that are individual. So um, yeah, it's, but, uh, it's been uh, implemented in specific ways. Yeah, but your models will become more powerful if you can actually combine data from multiple tenants, right? Yeah, so absolutely. This concept of global models, um, and I would argue that there's actually power in doing individual models as well. So think about the fact that if I, um, if I am, um, I think we had examples of like Uber and Comcast, and let's imagine they were solving the same problem, um, they would have totally different data sets. So like Uber, you know, might be talking about cars, and Comcast might be talking about like cable top, like set top boxes. These are like totally different concepts, um, but they might have data and features that are unique to them. And so we want to make sure that we can leverage those. So sort of that initial argument, which is there might be power in building one big global model um, for having a lot of history and kind of a, in the cold start problem, how do we begin from kind of a snapshot of time? Yes, it would be helpful. Um, there's the issue that we want to make sure that we can build things that are unique and leverage the data that is kind of, in some ways, a competitive advantage of each of these customers. Um, but then also the fact that some customers just do not want to share data, and so we can't. Um, so, you know, two competing companies do not want to be sharing data or insights. And so for those reasons, we keep them totally separate. Thank you for the great talk. It was really inspiring. My question is, are you writing your own algorithms from scratch, AI models, or did you consider using TensorFlow, stuff like that, to yeah, tap so, into GPU? So I, yeah, um, so we... Um, you know, we, we, we also have MetaMind, I guess, within the General Einstein umbrella, so I encourage you to check out MetaMind and what they do. Um, this sort of part of our platform is, is what we're working on, which uses Spark in particular. That's what I'm with Optimus Prime presenting. Um, not to say that there isn't some, you know, future work with bringing everything together. It's just that, you know, this is particularly Spark where we're leveraging what is in that community. Um, that doesn't mean to say that we do not implement our own, but, um, we rely mostly on top of what is there and, and then kind of bring to bear these derived features and, and those types of transformations that will be used across the board. Are you using GPUs anywhere? Or is it CPU processing? I encourage you to check out MetaMind okay, <laughs> for thank that you. in particular. Um, but yeah, I... I so I last should. question maybe? Okay. What do you think is or will be the task that is the most difficult to autom automate in this process? Or in other words, what will data scientists be spending the time on in the future? Yeah, um, I, I can tell you that, so my role is actually very specific in that I work with data scientists inside of self, Salesforce to help them use this platform. And so I really get exposure to like, as they're using it, you know, what do we absorb and work on next? I would say things, uh, there's, you know, people joke about like the time that's spent on engineering features, and that is a huge problem. And of course, having that repository, and again, like these really, these things that, for people that haven't like done it over and over again with Spark might think might be a little bit trivial um, around these runtime errors, those, we can fix those. But um, trying to get people to really think about this multi-tenant problem, and like how are you going to build something where you don't throw alerts for silly things all the time? Um, because once you're on pager duty and you're just getting those like at all hours, for 800,000 customers is going to be painful. Um, so I would say that type of like smart and self-healing that we, you know, that we should be working toward, um, I think is that, that next frontier. Um, we do have work around kind of that hyperparameter tuning, um, trying to automate that process as well, so you just kind of completely remove um, any of that pain. Um, there will always have to be feature engineering um, but I, I would say that's the exciting part, whereas the kind of smart alerting, alerting and monitoring um, is probably the biggest challenge that I see right now. Thanks. Great. Um, thanks so much. <laughs> <laughs>